Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Shoes Off Inside with me, May Lee, Kelly Hu, Tamlin Tamita. Hello, hello. ladies. Hi. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Uh, you know, eventually, and I say this all the time, eventually the three of us are going to be in the same damn room. <laughs> okay. If we could even just be in the same city, that would help. I know. That, right. that would be right. We're so looking forward to, you know, uh, to, to, to Kelly, you know, being able to you know, stop off at home for a little bit. So I know we can all together because she's such a jet traveler. So it's like, yeah, but well, we and I, I might be gone for good for a while. I ah! mean, in, in, a, in a little bit, who knows? I mean, yeah, you know, I know. but might You're... be making that trip to Vegas permanently. Well, permanently. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I know. Let's have, let, let everyone know what she's talking about. Yeah. You know, Kelly's thinking about moving to Vegas. Vegas, yeah, baby, Vegas. Reason. Yeah, because again, that's in the future, but just to just to backtrack, just a uh, literally a month or some weeks before that, we just wanted to recognize that wherever we're, you know, whenever you're watching and listening to this uh, podcast, is that we just wanted to recognize that the month of May was a hella busy month for all three of us, and that because not only was it Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander month, but also it was. Mental Health Awareness Month, as well as Military Caregivers Month. So the, the the subject that we're going to talk about today really connects with all three of those elements, those three thoughts, those three uh, journeys that we all are going to be participating in at some time of our lives. And that I just wanted to really acknowledge the efforts of uh, Kelly, as well as May, in bringing um, this conversation to the fore. And the reason why that Kelly might be moving is connected to one of those very reasons as well. That's right. Right. My parents, my parents who are already in Vegas. Yeah. You know, my mom is 85 years old this year. Yeah. And, um, and I just, you know, decided that it was really important for me to spend quality time with them while they're still able to get around and do You're things and daughter. see You're shows. Like, yeah. I well, know. you know, my, you yeah. know, I, I owe my mom everything. She yeah. was a yeah. single mom who raised two kids all by herself. And, um, and, uh, you know, I, I, she's been waiting for us to have the time to be finished with our work so that we can like, <laughs> you know, she's like, she keeps telling me you have enough to retire. You have oh. enough to retire. She's like, just don't spend any more money. You have enough to retire. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my God. I'm like, just don't she's gamble gonna, all my lucky. inheritance away. <laughs> you know, she's lucky to have you. She's so, so lucky to have yeah. you and to consider, you know, going to be with her, you know, it, it's, it's, it makes it's a difference. A, such a loving gesture. It does make a difference. Well, so, well you know, Kelly, I don't wait. have children of my own. I don't even yeah. have a partner. So it's it's an easy move for me. It's an you know, it's it's not that difficult. And Vegas is is so close to Los Angeles. You know, if I ever need to come back for work or whatever, I'll just drive back if I have to. Yeah, exactly. Um, Kelly, when's the last time you lived in the same city or town as your mother? Oh gosh, wow. since I was like 18. Oh, so it's I moved been that out long. Yeah. when I was 18. Yeah. Okay. So it's been that long since you've been like geographically close to her. Close yeah. to your mom. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's what happens, right? I mean, that's why I moved back from Asia, you know, to be closer to my parents um, back in 2010. And, and you're you know, actively taking care of your mom too. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. you know, she doesn't live with me, but you know, I do c- visit her regularly, call her every and day. And you're a single, you're a single kid. No, I have an older brother and he lives lives in the area too. So we kind of tag team it, thankfully. Right. Mm -hmm. And as you know, and a lot of the listeners and viewers know by now, you know, my dad was tragically killed only one year after I moved back from Asia for that very reason to be closer to my parents. So when that happened, it was glass half empty. I was like, are you kidding me? I only got one year. You only got one year, right? Yeah, but at least you got that year. Imagine if you were not around. That's what. That's so. I had to flip the script. I had to look at the glass half full. Um, and it took me a while to get there, but I realized, thank God, I came back when I did, because I had that year. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. So I do tell so many people that I, anyone I can, if you have the opportunity to live closer and be closer to your parents and your family while they're still here. Do yeah. it. Well, anyway, the reason why we're talking about all this, of course, and as as Tamlin said, you know, about caregiving and military families and veterans, there's and a mental new, health and mental health. There is a documentary um, called Unconditional, 
That yes. was done by our dear friend, Richard Louie. And Richard yes. is an MSNBC anchor, but he's an author and uh, now a filmmaker. This is his second documentary. Right. And so this one really focuses on the idea of caregiving and mental health um, when it comes to caregivers and, you know, the struggles that they all also go through um, mm -hmm. and the pressure that they feel. And he features three oh. different families, including his own, because mm -hmm. he ended up being a caregiver for his father who was suffering from dementia. And then now his mother, because she also now struggles with it because of the years of sacrifice that she made caring for her husband. So it's a fascinating, very moving documentary. Very moving, the three of us all saw it. Emotional, fun, yes. funny, funny and, at times. And, uh, yeah. just, uh, at the end of the day, uplifting yeah. story that um, we all can relate to. Yeah. In, in, whatever chapter of our lives we are at because they really look at the children as well. Yeah. Um, right. It, it's, it's a very human story and yeah. we're just so proud of our, our, our fellow brother. We are. Uh, and yeah, we're so, so happy. we have to mention that um, we have a new sponsor of our show, Shoes Off Inside. And this is related. I'm bringing this up because it's related. Yay. It's AARP. <laughs> And AARP is our latest sponsor, and they also are they are one of the title sponsors of this documentary, Unconditional. So very yes. involved in this, and uh, you'll hear in the interview with Richard how AARP Daphne Kwok was the inspiration in terms of having him make this documentary. So that's a really good story that he he will share with us. But um, but yeah, AARP, you know, um, they're they think giving care and caregiving is important at any age and a loved one can bring us closer together. And that's their mission um, to educate and inform and help others to do the same. And so we want to thank ARP for being a sponsor, but they also have a lot of information um, that yes. they provide on their website. So you can go to aarp.org slash caregiving for more information because they just have loads of it. And obviously they're walking the walk because they're involved in this documentary. What's so wonderful about ARP and particularly like individuals like Daphne Kwok is they're continuously, consistently learning because they're just so wondering and wondrous of the world and what's happening that they continue to continue upon that journey of discovery yeah. Um, and learning and educating and becoming enlightened because being retired doesn't mean that your life is ended. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. it just continues on another path. And that's the joy. That's the joy of life. And I really do applaud, you know, uh, AARP joining on this shoes off inside. Yes, because, <laughs> because they love the fact that the three of us are definitely in the AARP age range. <laughs> so we're right there. <laughs> We're right, right there. there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a listen to. Uh, oh, and Tamlin couldn't join us on this interview, but you'll hear why uh, in the interview. So let's go to that with Richard Louis. Richard, welcome to Shoes Off Inside. So good to have you. Oh, thanks for having me. It's good to see both of you. I know. And, and you know, we, we are sorry that Tamlin is not with us during this interview. Um, she is actually taking care of her mom. Uh, her mom mm. is fine, but she is, you know, running her some errands for her and shopping for her. And I thought it was kind of appropriate that that is why she's not yeah. with us because your documentary and your story is all about taking care of your father and mother. And we kind of all know what that's like because we all have elderly parents. Right? right. We're at that age. We are at that age. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it's, 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 as you know, both that it's tough, but at the same time, um, I'm sure Tamlin enjoys a, a lot of the time, if not all the time that she's with, uh, her mom, it's yeah. sometimes things are difficult, but, uh, hats off to you, Tamlin doing that stuff. I, I totally know. get it. I know we all get it. And, you know, I, I said to her when she texted and said, you know, I can't join because, you know, I'm with my mom. And I said, listen, your mom our parents are our pr the priority. And yeah. so that's number one. So we totally get it. I mean, I, you know, take care of my mom too when she needs me. And so um, we, we all understand. 
Um, mm-hmm. But that, that's a great segue into why we have you on the show, Richard. I mean, you've just come out with this unbelievable new documentary called Unconditional. First of all, congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. Oof, yes. Boy. Seven years in the making. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, it is such a powerful documentary in so many ways because it is about you know, um, taking care of family members, mental illness, um, self-care. And then ultimately it's about love, right? Mm-hmm. That love can truly conquer almost all, right? Yeah. And these yeah. three families that you feature, including you and your dad and your mom and your sister, um, I mean, what a testament to that whole theme of love. T- tell us more about that and how, how you felt, you know, during this process. Yeah, you know, it was, um, it was, uh, it started in one place and ended up in another. Huh. Um, I, I really didn't want to film myself uh, or my family, uh, but it was started by a mentor of mine, Daphne Kwok, who works at ARP and said, you know, I hear, this is seven years ago, I hear that you are flying from New York to San Francisco three times a month to care for your dad. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, I'd, I'd, would you be open to us filming you? Uh, and I was like, to doing what? And this is the most, I think both of you have probably gone through the same journey. Well, I'm just doing what I do as a family member, right? That's just what I'm doing. Um, and she said, well, there's actually a lot of you folks doing this. There's, there's like 53 million at least. And that was seven years ago. I mean, I, I bet that number's in the 60s, right, at the moment. And that was the beginning of my education, that we have this huge cultural gap um, that we if there is 53 million of us doing this. Right. The two of you included. um, We don't identify as this. We don't identify it. We don't. There's no lower third. Right. That says I'm a caregiver. Yeah. Yeah. When, When there should be. Right. 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 Yeah. It's just a given. I mean, a caregiver, but it's 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 just so many of us. It's just a given. That's just what you do as a family member. But it is interesting now that in this documentary, you're really focusing on, you know, how heavy this burden is, but the willingness of family members to just make the sacrifice and just do it without question, right? And I think that's that's something to really honor. And I think you do it beautifully in this documentary. Let's talk about the three different families that you feature, again, including yourself. Um, you have the Luke Bouchatz, right, and his family, um, and then the Hendrick, uh, Kate Hendricks Thomas, and then of course you and your your family. Um, how did you go yeah. about finding uh, the the people that you were going to feature in this, and and why? Um, the we, we we had a lot as so from that beginning, you know, when I was I started uh, uh, doing the film, the filming of myself, then I started to do more talking and speaking on it. And I had more relationships with community-based organizations and NGOs along the way that were involved in caregiving. That's when it kind of blew open the doors. I was like, wow, there's a lot of stuff out there. And despite all that stuff out there, organizations trying to do something to help folks like ourselves, we still didn't know about it. And they are the ones that I said, can you help me in your communities? Show me people that might fit this idea of caregiving. Uh, and I wanted a different complexion, if you will, not skin and color necessarily, but that was part of it, but a different complexion of, of region and, and space and time and, and, and experience, uh, life experience. And so um, the way I met uh, the Bouchats family as well as the Thomas family are, complete, are through two different organizations. And they were very protective of these, these families. Mm-hmm. And um, a- as I was going through this, I, I remember when I first started reporting on human trafficking um, that I was in, I was learning what it meant to be receiving these stories from survivors or or current, um, if you will, labor and, and sex slaves and how I would handle the story they were giving me. And I definitely applied it in this case. I, I do believe what they were sharing with me and they were so open and so vulnerable that I had to protect their story. I, I took it like it was like you gave me something. I'm now going to protect it to the end. So I've been protecting it for the last seven years, and I will guard it as we move forward in the marketing phase of the film over the next year. And 
that's the way the NGOs and the CBOs were with me as well. They're like, well, I don't know. If, who are you, Richard? Mm. Why, why should we connect these people that we want to help? Are you just another one of those helicopter journalists? Yeah. yeah. Right, right. But uh, you obviously gained their trust over the years. I paid them a lot of money. I'm not paying them money. <laughs> yes, I I, 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 when I sat down with them, I, I mean, I, I, I got to tell you, man, Kelly, it was just, uh, it was astonishing what I, what I felt in terms of their openness. Yes. I, I was astonished at how much they shared, um, especially the vet who I thought would have been a much harder interview, um, yeah. sharing his experiences yeah. in Afghanistan and all the things that had happened to him in detail. It was really eye opening. Yeah. It was it, it just it it my my heart just went out to him and his family as well, you know. I I've actually visited troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. I saw these soldiers that had just sort of blank looks on their faces. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, how are these poor people going to go home and get back into society after this, after they've experienced so much? And he was so um, open about all of that. It was really um, educational and as well as just, um, you know, heartwarming to see yeah you know, his family and how they were dealing with all of the struggles, especially the kids. Yes, yeah. the kids. The older Absolutely, son yeah. who was so uh, sensitive. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, Huck and Dave, right? Huck and Dave. Yes. Uh, for the kids of the, in, the, in the, the Alaska family, Bouchats, the Bouchatses, and I filmed them the longest. Um, and they're, like right now, the, the youngest who was like, you know, I guess under five or five feet is now six foot two. Oh, my uh, gosh. <laughs> he's huge now. He's huge. Uh, but a really nice kid. And, and um, that openness, which I think is one of the, the things about the documentary that stands out, is is trying to take that vulnerability and that openness of the journey that they were both sharing with all of us, both families and my own is to put it into the narrative of mental health and caregiving in a way that would be exploratory about the very definitions of those two words. How do we talk about mental health in a way that is new and exploratory as opposed to the stereotype that mental health equals mental illness, which it does not. And is that's the, that's that is the cultural, you know, uh, misnomer or or, or mis misattachment, if you will, in terms of its definition. And I'm so glad that we can talk about it that way today. Yeah, you know, Richard, so Richard that, you're oh, sort of going through this with mom now, right? Flying back and forth, taking care of your mom. I mean, the story starts with you flying back and forth, taking care of your dad from coast to coast you know, three times a week. Are you doing it that often still? Yeah, I'm doing it once a once uh -huh. a month now. Uh -huh. Yeah, because my mom's um, she she has 24 hour care, mm -hmm. but she doesn't have the debility, the, the extremes of, of uh, Alzheimer's and that debility, uh, disability, excuse me, uh, that is good in a way, but at the same time, um, it's tough to see her go through this change, but she's, she, she, she gave so much. This is part of why she is living through what she is right now. She gave so much to take care of my dad. She slept on the couch for, for years. Yeah. You, and you don't sleep well, as right. you were talking, we were talking a little bit earlier about how sleep affects, so yes, affects the brain and all the, and the associated disabilities. I believe, you know, I first talked to my mom after we, we made that tough choice of putting my dad into a, a healthcare home. I talked to her just in the kitchen for a moment and I was like, oh, yeah, it did hurt you. It did take something away from you. And she was always the sharpest, strongest, most on top of everything. Mm. And but she'd been living on adrenaline for five years. Because Richard, oh. I mean, your father was ill for eight years is that how long that sort of lasted yeah. right so that was That's eight right. years of your mother and you yeah. and the rest of your family but your mom for sure 
continuously, constantly caring for your father until, until yeah. the end when you, when he was put into the care facility, but still that is incredible stress, both physically and mentally on your mother. Um, that, uh, we, we have to, you know, like you were saying before, we have to be more aware of what effects that has on people. And like you said, me mental health is not necessarily mental illness, but it's something that we should pay attention to and prevent or at least, you know, address before it turns into something bigger. Yeah. And, 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 and I know if I ask my mom, hey, did you go through a mental health journey during that? She'd go, what are you talking about? Yeah. Even for me, uh, I was uh, sitting at a, 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 a on the San Francisco Bay Area Premier at Camp Fest, Go Camp Fest, uh, this past weekend. And um, uh, the moderator turned to me and said, so are you OK? And I was interesting because I was like, I liked that that moderator did that because that's the whole purpose of the documentary that I would talk about my own mental health. And I was like, you know, hmm, first of all, I've never been asked that. And before, I probably would have taken that negatively, mm. more negatively than positively. And now I take it more positively than negatively. Right. Not saying it's a 90, 10, you know, something like that. I'm talking about, you know, 51, 49. And I, and I said to him, I was like, you know, today I'm okay. But there are days where I don't know if I am. And I need to explore what that means and be okay with it. So my mom not knowing it was certainly challenged uh, when it came to her mental health. I was too. And again, mental health does not equal mental illness. Yeah. And we got to get around that. We talk about physical health in positive ways, right? What we eat, yeah. mm -hmm, what we travel with, what we put in our suitcase when we travel. <laughs> uh, and one of the things I say is, you know, mental health always, oh, mental health typically means what's wrong as opposed to what is strong. Yeah. And we do need to think about how mental health can be a strength. Richard, you were saying that before you would have kind of questioned, am I, you know, why are you asking me if I'm okay, right? So that mm -hmm. definitely is a barrier that we need to penetrate a little bit more. Um, as a society oh, yeah. on the whole, but especially a API community, you know, it's, it's not a very Asian thing to talk about mental health, talk about weakness, talk about vulnerability. Uh, and so you're saying your mom would be like, what are you talking about? Same with my mom. She would say the same thing after the death of my father. Right. So yeah, that's right. something that we really need to work on, um, as, well, on, as a community. And, and, and on top of that, when you put gender on being a, a, a person of color, like my mom being a, a person of color and being a woman and, you know, her whole experience growing up being the youngest daughter was that she of course would never squawk and say anything and knowing what she went through when she was growing up in Southern California, you know, in South Central, she was expected to cook and clean and close the, the corner store. And she studied only at 1 a.m. when she had finished everything, you know, and she would never be, never complain. This all fits into that idea of being a, uh, not only a person of color and API in this case, but also being a woman yeah. is that those on top of each other in the caregiving construct really need to be addressed and, and looked at in a unique way. And, you know, I, I, I would, I, I, I gathered the courage to ask my mom that very question within the last year or two. I said, so mom, you're the youngest and you're also the smartest, but you're also the one that I can tell, you know, you raised two of your brothers but you're also the youngest. And I know you, you've you told me stories about working in the corner store until midnight. I've always wondered why you're a night owl, you know? Mm. And so when I, you apply that to the caregiving, mm. and that first, first of all, when I asked her that, she was like, oh, yeah, I guess so. And you, you both know what that means. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the, I think that women of that generation, it's just assumed that you yes. are going to put yourself last and sacrifice for everyone else, right. yes. you know, that your life does not count as much as everyone else's, you know, yeah. that you are going to just power through. Yep. And I think that's how so many women of that generation have just lived just powering through yeah. putting themselves yeah. last up until the very last day exactly you know yeah yeah, 
When your mom, your mom saw this, right? The documentary? No. <gasps> she hasn't. Why? No. Does she not want to? You know, at this point, my mom, so she didn't see the first one either. She might watch the second one. Um, it's just, you know, uh, her attention span because she got, got diagnosed with dementia about three months ago. Her too. Yeah, her, she as well. And so it's, you know, my, my sister and I kind of talked about it because we, we also had a screening at the White House last week. And, you know, these are all things that, you know, I would invite my mom for sure, right? You bet your bottom dollar I would have done that. Yeah. But I just know where she's at right now. There's certain capacities and certain things. She, it's not like I don't want to show it to her. I'd yeah. be the, my first instinct to do so. But yeah, it's it's. I get it's, that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you that kind of point. Have, yeah, it, uh, you you kind of have to pick and cho choose what's going to maybe cause too much strain on them, too much effort. Um, but I also wonder: Do you think that would be it would be difficult for her to watch because of the scenes with your father and sort of bringing mm. the, back those memories or is she has she is she now at peace with with all the years that she went through with your dad? I think she is at peace. Um, I don't think it would be difficult. It won't be easy, but it won't be difficult okay. um, because she's moved on. I think you know as you're taking care of the loved one, it's the it's they call it you know the long goodbye. I think she she definitely had gone through the long goodbye for my sister watching the movie. Uh, she did not watch it until um, the L.A. world premiere. Like, that's the first time she saw it. And uh, it's going to be a big, uh, it would be tough for her, really tough. And it was, she told because me. You see her break down in the film. Yes. And, and yeah. I remember experiencing something similar when my grandmother uh, had dementia. And the first time I realized that she didn't know who I was, it killed me. Yeah. I, this is a grandmother that I lived with, you know, she helped to raise me. And I remember just being so hurt by the fact that she didn't know who I was anymore. And it just, oh, it, I mean, I think about it now and I want to cry, but it's, it's painful. It's painful when somebody that you love, somebody that, you know, has raised you doesn't even know who you are anymore. You know, it's hard. Yeah. And that journey you went through, Kelly, I mean, when you think back, um, would you do anything different today, right? If you went through the same, same, journey, if you, if you had to approach that. You always wish that you had spent more time, right? You, that's always people's wish on their dying beds, right? On their deathbeds. They're always, oh, I wish I had spent more time with my family and friends. Um, and, and, and when you have, even when you're with somebody 24 hours a day as a caregiver, you always have regrets. You'll always say, oh, I wish I had done this, or I wish I was better. I wish I didn't yell at them. I wish I didn't get, you know, lose my temper or, or, you know, I wasn't so grouchy. I mean, there's always going to be those kinds of regrets. So Richard, asking you the same question, having gone through what you've been through now, would you do anything differently? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, you know, this time when I, the, the, the documentary was a way of me working through what was very difficult and trying to be productive. And I think that was, um, an expression of me always looking for solutions mm -hmm. and trying to make something that I could not change, even though I was traveling back and forth and working my darndest, you know, to try to help my dad. I also knew that I couldn't do, it wasn't enough. And so the, the film, you know, I'd stop, I'd fly and I'd stop somewhere and then I'd continue on to, 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 to get home and vice versa across the country. And I believe that was a, both a, a way of rest, a way of uh, therapy. Um, and I would say that along the way, but I really do look back at that and say, that's why you were doing that. And, and, and to, be, to be honest with both of you, I did not really truly believe it in like right here until like six, seven months ago when we said, OK, we're done editing. Mm. And I was like, yeah, this really was my way of not only it being therapy, but also trying to be constructive, right? Trying to build something out of something that was so hurtful and so tough, yet also, you know, I laughed in a lot of new ways, which we, can, we should talk about too, but uh, 
that I think has taught me that this, if I go through it again, like with my mom is because I've already kind of worked through it is I'll spend more of my time with her mm. and maybe less about, cause I've kind of worked through it in a way. That's what I think. I don't know. Cause I'm kind of in the beginning of the journey with my mom now. Yeah. Um, but that's we, what I think. We should mention Richard that your father passed only last year, right? Yeah, he passed a year and a half ago. Yeah, a year and a half ago. Okay, so it has it hasn't been that long uh, after a, yeah. lo- a long and difficult journey. Um, but le- can I ask you a, a, a personal question? You certainly don't have to. Of course, you don't have to answer because you mentioned it was therapeutic. Did you actually go to therapy? No, you didn't. I did not. And why? No. Why? Just I'm curious because we're talking about mental health and obviously most yeah. people say, oh, well, if you have mental health issues that are, you know, you should go to seek therapy, but you know, not for everyone. Yeah. Right. So tell us, tell us what, why you haven't been or, or, you know, what, what how you feel about that. Uh, I'm open to it. Um, but I was talking a lot about my feelings and what I was going through uh, for the last uh, seven years because of uh, I've, I've done a lot of speaking now with different organizations because I'm I become sort of a, like a caregiving advocate, if you yeah. will. And I would always try to answer um, not in the perfect, you know, news anchor way, if you will. I would when if you were to ask me, like, how are you doing right now? I I, I try to stop. um and I'll do this I'll often, look away and think mm. and then answer the question mm-hmm. because it it's it was a, it's an opportunity for me to really check myself. And then when people ask me on the side, like if I would see the two of you in a, at an event and you would ask me, I would go, hmm. Mm. Yeah, I try to be as honest with myself. And I, I, I and then d- during the edit process, when I was explaining to the editor and the, the producer, like why we need to have this frame versus that frame or this order versus another and the dynamic of why that's difficult and why that would make somebody like, why am I showing? So for instance, in the edit of, in the film, a big choice is whether to show my mother falling and, and how much. Yeah. Yeah. And I did it because it was, uh, it was as hurtful as you think it might be to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I needed to show, you know, this is really, really tough. Yeah. And that, so all of these discussions were like therapy sessions mm. for me at least. Yeah. Right. Right. Cause you were seeing it play out before your eyes. Well, yeah. I'd have to explain like the two of you were to say to me right now, why did you choose to show your mom fall? Why? Isn't, isn't that, doesn't that hurt you, Richard? Or are you being, are you taking advantage of that? Is this some sort of shock thing? And no, um, yeah, no, that's not, that's not why, but I would have to answer. Um, or, or why is it that I, why is it that I knew that Amy Bouchatz was so conflicted about knowing, but not knowing about the, the, the mental challenges, mental health challenges that her husband was facing that she wanted to know, but she didn't want to know. Yes. Right. 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 And I could explain that, like why she didn't want to know and know. And that nuance, you know, in the first edits was not there. Hmm. And once we decided we wanted to show a caregiver wanting to know, but not wanting to know, that's a whole other different level. And it's tough to get across. Right. And it's so much more truthful. Yes. Yes. Instead of being sort of glossed over or, you know, made pretty. Right. Yes. That's, you know, that's what this is about. I think watching your film, I realized that that this was going to show the difficult stuff, too. I mean, you know, a lot of what you showed was so um, personal and deep and things that people just don't talk about, you know. And they don't want to admit. Your dad, your dad pooping everywhere. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> yes, that's right. Right, but, but, right. You know, Things like that that people don't talk about, right? Yeah, or laugh about it. Right. Or laugh about it, exactly. Or laugh about yeah. It. But it's considered shameful or embarrassing or, you know, whatever. But these are facts. 
facts. These are yeah. facts that, you know, people have to deal with when taking care of elderly people. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, both of you in, in, in your journeys of caregiving in your, in, in your life. And again, Rosalind Carter says there's four types of people, right? Uh, you're going to be a caregiver. You are a caregiver. You receive care, right? Or you have received already care, right? Yeah. It's one of those four. And so those are, those are kind of uh, the amazing realities uh, or understandings. I think that you're, you're, you're talking about is that, yeah, um, you will laugh in a different way. I was laughing as soon as you said pooping. Um, <laughs> and I, I did one interview and I remember the, the, the organization said, so Richard, do you want us to still keep the poop thing in? <laughs> and I was like, yes, I do still want you to keep the poop thing in. Cause <laughs> I, we laugh about it all the time. Uh, uh, cause my dad was such a prodigious pooper, uh, of course, outside the bathroom. <laughs> um, and, 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 and we, we would, we were laughing about it in a different way because we would, we had a, you know, you have it too, probably the family thread, right? The group chat. And we would use the, the poop emoji to and we had a scale of one to four. So oh, no. if 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 he had a one, if he had a one emoji, that meant eh, teeny. If he had a four, that was like, you know, oh, get my out gosh. of the way. And yeah. We would laugh about it all the time. We we really did for, for all sorts of, you know, family reasons, right? And um, you have to find that. Yeah. You have to find that in in caregiving because there's so much that can really make you so frustrated and depressed that if you don't find the humor in these moments, then there's nothing but sadness and depression and frustration. Yeah. And let yourself. Yeah. Wow. Hey, Richard. So uh, just curious. And then this is your second documentary. Your first one was Sky Blossom. And that was about younger, uh, the younger generation taking care of uh, their veteran relatives, right? So either uh, vets who are fathers, mothers, you know, grandfathers, um, and then this is your second and award-winning filmmaker now is your title. So <laughs> Richard, you and I go way back, right? We knew each other in Singapore, um, in the yeah. early two thousands. <laughs> I mean, seriously, a long time ago. Um, did you ever think you would be this? I mean, I'm so impressed. I really am. I have to say. <laughs> no, I mean, I thank you for that. Uh, uh award-winning is, you know subjective um of course and, and talk to the pr people right we we all three know that stuff <laughs> but i would say I, I'm, I'm 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 i am um i am surprised that now uh it's the second feature length documentary uh that we've gotten the distribution that we have um as you both know you can make it but sometimes it's like a tree in a forest but yeah. Being in the media, as the three of us are, you know, I definitely focused on the last mile and how to get it out there. And I am surprised, but um, I'm also, I mean, I, my, my first book included a lot about caregiving as well. And I did not think any of those things would be where I'm at today, mm. you know, I, at all. And this is why when I talk about our, our caregiving journeys, is that you know you will you will find the joy despite difficulty and you will be surprised about the person you end up being. I did not think I'd be sitting here talking to the two of you, uh, two of my heroes, uh, and you too, Tamlin, uh, at, at this moment. But what got me to this place where we are sitting down to talk is because there's only one thing that care I cared about the most, and that was taking care of my dad and my mom during those times. And I am surprised. And sometimes I even joke that maybe my dad didn't have Alzheimer's. And he was just because you know, he's a pastor. <laughs> and I was not, I was your typical pastor's kid where I was not a good kid. I did not follow, you know, kicked out of two high schools, did not go to college. <laughs> oh, like, man, you, you dude. Got, you got, right? You got my thing. And, <laughs> Guessing my I, the joke I tell is that my dad didn't have Alzheimer's. You just sitting there. I'm going to pretend like I have Alzheimer's. <laughs> it's like this is helping Richard do the right thing. You oh know? my gosh! <laughs> wow, it isn't it funny though how how life works and the universe, God, yeah. um, you know, depending on your faith and what your spiritual spirituality is, how that course yeah. does reveal itself in the most oh unusual ways. I, I would never have known. Yeah, it's just the most ridiculous thing. You know, I, not a person that talks about 
feelings, faith, spirituality. This is not my lane, right? <laughs> Definitely not my lane. Yeah, but that's how that's how it works sometimes. It is now. Exactly. <laughs> it is now, Richard, and you're 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 traveling on that lane really really well and that path that you're carving out for yourself and others. That's that's what's so amazing that you're inspiring others to really t pay attention to these issues and topics that you know, in the past were, were never really addressed and focused on. It's so important, especially in our community, because so much of it has been repressed, right? We, you know, we were taught not to, or I know I was taught not to show feelings. Don't even be too happy because people will get jealous or, you know, people, you don't want to show that you're upset or too happy or, or if you have experiences, I remember, you know, my mom would say, why you got to talk about that? Just, you know, put it in a box and lock it up and, and put it in your heart and just, you know, throw away the key. And I was like, no, this is why I need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's how they were raised back then. Right. And so yeah. a lot of unwrapping to do in order to be able to get there and, and be able to be okay with talking yeah. about our feelings and our imperfections. Yeah. Yeah. Don't talk like that. Don't talk like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, don't bring attention to yourself. You know, my mother still tells me not to talk about too many yeah. controversial things because you know, it'll, my bring, <laughs> it'll bring trouble. And I'm like too late for that mom. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what I do for a living. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you know, we, we love them. Gosh, yeah, that's why we do what we do for them. Um, and because you, why at the end of the day, we all know this because we know how much they sacrifice for us. Mm -hmm. We do. That's right. And that is ultimately yeah. why we return as much love as we can in their time of need. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's what moved me so much, Richard, about your story, um, that you continue to care for your mother after all those years of carrying your father, flying back and forth from New York, trying anchoring on the weekends, flying, you know, during the week. That to me was just so beyond unbelievable um, and so moving that I, I really was like, damn, Richard, you are seriously um, superhuman. Um, but the Crazy. love, but the love, it was just, it was just pure love. Yeah. And that was a beautiful thing to watch. So thank you for Great. doing that. And thank you for showing us that as an Asian male. Um, mm. I'm going <laughs> to point that out. No, I'm going to point that out because I think that yeah. is so powerful to see that. Right. And you're, you're, yeah. you're opening up your heart in that way. I think that's very significant for people to see that. Yeah. It, it, and that whole dynamic that you bring up about, you know, again, gender on top of being person of color and uh which the you, you, the both of you understand very well it's, it's very relevant in but in different ways and similar ways and i i when you t even talk about male caregivers the, the estimation according to arp is like 45 percent are men oh wow um, but right but you're like wait that can't be right um we never have thought we don't that. talk about it yeah. right we, we don't talk about it, right? And culture also doesn't talk about it. So yeah. we, and that's why I brought up my mom's example, uh, being a woman and a, and a caregiver, but me being male and a caregiver, I never even thought of that gender separation. But then again, there we go again, right? Well, that's a whole different uh, discussion, yeah. right? Which uh, you've certainly touched on before, but I'm glad you brought that up because uh, for all the male caregivers out there, please talk about it. Um, because we're all in this together, right? Uh, whether ma male or female, and and that's really really important. Here's here's my question: None of us have children. Who's going to be caregiving for us? I'm that calling up Kelly. Uh, you too, May. Uh, but yeah, that's a really good question. It's a very and, good. Question. I mean, so many people now are choosing not to have children, right? Mm -hmm. And the number one reason I think for a lot of people to have kids is for somebody to take care of them in their old age. Um, maybe the next, this generation is going to be about how to get caregivers when you don't have children. 
you know, I think that's going to be maybe the next documentary of, of, of people having to grow old without yeah. children to take care of them. And, and that's the purpose of these two documentaries uh, and, and this stuff is, is to say a caring society is something we need to look at and understand and what are the best practices. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And by looking at these families and then those children that were aged in Sky Blossom, the first one aged uh, 11 to 26, is that we need to reinforce this value because that's a good one. Mm-hmm. And it, we, but we don't talk about it. So hopefully when it becomes time when I Giving that this value is more broadly talked about, mm. more broadly integrated into our great American culture, and that we do have those institutions and processes and, and assistance that we'll need. And we've we, we've we've made some of that progress. I mean, uh, this White House signed the most uh, advanced uh, executive order possible, like you can do no more for caregiving and caregivers. There's it's the most ever. Mm. So we are in a different time in our history. Let's hope it keeps on going. Yeah. 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 That's we a, need it. That's a great point. And you know what, Kelly? I think that's a great episode idea of how mm-hmm. do we create communities of support that are outside of the box, right? Because we do have to start restructuring and reimagining what a family is, right? It's not the traditional uh, ideal anymore. And so that's something that I talk about with my friends all the time is that how are we going to support each other if none of us have children or we don't have that kind of support system? Do we create our own kinds of communities, right? Um, and live in sort of like a commune of some kind. But no, but I was just going to say, so, a you commune. know, <laughs> we talk about these things, but I think that's a whole different subject that is really should be explored because yeah. the traditional family structure is is changing dramatically um yeah 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 yeah. but uh hey richard i i I want to see that one too me exactly exactly maybe you'll come back on we we can share stories about that as well but uh man i'm so proud of you richard seriously i i am i'm so proud and i'm so honored to call you my friend and i'm so glad to have known you since you were just a wee little tot no i'm just kidding But uh, yeah, I hearken back to the days in Singapore and then where where we are now and what we're doing. And like you said, all of us are working towards the same mission, right? To put some good out there in the world and you're doing it. So thanks for sharing your time today with us and uh, keep doing what you're Uh, doing. Thank you, May. Thank you, Kelly. And and thank you, Tamlin. Uh, By the way, Tamlin uh, hosted the world premiere for us. And so thank you, Tamlin, so much for that. This is definitely the right community to to be in the three of with the three of you. So thanks so much. Thanks, Richard. All right, you take care. We'll see you soon. All right. Hey, Richard. Thank you so very much for allowing me to be the yip yapper for the <laughs> world premiere. <laughs> I know. was there. You and did a good such job. A joy to see May Lee at that premiere as well. It was I like, know. you're going to be here. I didn't <laughs> know you're going to be here. Yeah, uh, but um, it, 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 it was just a very small part. But you did all the work for how many years in in Seven. concentrating on three threes families. And again, just uh, just a reminder that this is the second of a planned trilogy of uh, films about caregiving. And that unconditional is second to sky blossoms. And it's about just what it, does it mean to care? The the time, the energy, the effort, and literally, you know, Richard has walked the walk and is still continuing to walk the walk with his mom and along with his sister. Oh. And just in so, so, so inspirational to so many families across the nation. And that one statistic that we all think that us women are the, the natural nurturing caregivers, but that 45%, almost half, are men. So yeah. we applaud our brothers. We applaud our that brothers and sisters across the board yeah. for taking the time to to take to care for the ones they love. So I that, know that, and that, each one of you are also caregivers as well. Yeah, that data point surprised me that forty five percent of caregivers right? are men. Um, but you know yeah, they don't. That's they don't, prejudicial. That's prejudicial on yeah. my part. It's like I think oh all of us. Yeah, but uh, but you know, but they don't. They don't really talk about it. Um, and as mm-hmm. Richard said in the interview, you, we need to talk about it more. We need to share about yeah. caregiving more so people can connect in that way. Um, but, but again, at the top of the show, we said, you know, ARP is our new sponsor of the show of shoes off inside. Mm-hmm. And they also were the, uh, title, uh, partner in, uh, unconditional. So if you need more resources about caregiving, 
AARP has a great resource page on their website. So again, that's aarp.org slash caregiving uh, to find out more information. Uh, so, but here's the other thing. We cannot forget about our other sponsor of this show. Right. We just have sponsors coming out of our ears That's now, right. <laughs> which is <laughs> Lemieux. Um, they continue to be our other sponsor too. And um, we wanted to do a short segment sponsored by Lemieux about maybe how we have dealt with our mental health or caregiving issues or you know anything that's related to these subjects that, that, that we've been covering in this episode. So who wants to start with a tip or a story or something about caregiving or mental health? Well, you said who, so I thought you meant Kelly who. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you Kel throwing it out Kelly who? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you guys I, I, yet. Sorry, I didn't tell you guys yet about my uh, my beauty days, right? With what? my boyfriend. Oh yeah, yeah, you did. That was the last the last episode. Yeah, that was the last episode. Yeah. yeah. So so about you know, I think I think that um, caring for ourselves is is more important, if not Primary. just as important. Is yeah, exactly you know you have to fill your own tank right before yeah. you can give to other people. So, you know, for me, um, you know, caring for myself, whether it be, you know, downtime or tuning things out like crazy politics <laughs> sometimes, yeah. um, um, you know, cause sometimes it, it gets, you know, just so stressful, you know, that you have to just tune everything out and, and, you know, have a nice bath, do a nice face mask, watch whatever show, like for me right now, it's um, Drag Race. <laughs> 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 I'm binging on Drag Race in my face mask. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that for me is my caregiving. Yeah. It's like, you know, sitting down with a cup of tea, watching Drag Race and laughing with my face mask. I think that's super important. It's, it, that's, yeah. that's what they always say. You know, you put your oxygen mask on first, yeah. right? Yeah. Before helping others. Yeah. And, I and think only that's really you true. know how to take care of you. Yeah. It's like, right. Yeah. And some people can say and look at you and say, oh, she's, you know, Tam's being self-indulgent or Kelly's, you know, but again, only we know what's going to make us feel better in order to carry on in taking care of not only ourselves, but the other people that mean so much to us. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, exactly. It's that airline announcement yes. too. Right. Cause you don't want to be short tempered with them. Exactly. No. Short you know? breath. Right. Yeah. Short, exactly. short of breath, short of energy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Cause it can get there really easily, especially when you're dealing with people with like dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah. All right. So Tamlin, what's your, what's your tip or advice or story that you have about? Well, well I, I think I, I get the advantage of, of, of capitalizing on the in-between talk with uh, May and Kelly is like, you know, the, the idea that mental health is something that we deal with and choose to deal with every day. It's, when we read the news, when we consume the news, when you digest the news and it sits into your belly and it foments and it just becomes really just, just depressing. It's like, I, I have to, I have to end the day with, with, with animal videos <laughs> or something <laughs> cute, something <laughs> trivial, something light. Yes. And what my joy is sometimes is that I see Kelly liking that same video or May Lee liking that same video <laughs> and a number of friends liking those same videos because it just makes my day a little bit brighter. It makes my day, it makes my heart a little bit fuller, or it makes me feel my heart again to know that people are out there good good people, selfless people are taking care of, of animals, of taking care of babies, of taking care of other human beings in unselfish ways. And that's so uplifting. It just reminds me that I have the ability to do so in the same way. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a part of a daily routine when you scroll through social media. It's like, oh man, he did this or, oh man, she said that. And it's like, it's the, the, the kind of grinds away. Mm -hmm. But it's those simplistic acts. And yes, people can make fun of me all day, but that's what I need to do in order to be bright, to be happy, to laugh and to connect and say, did you see that little puppy get yes. rescued by the little duckling <laughs> across the street? So it's again, so did you see that baby panda sneeze? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or, the or, the, or the little tiger scare his mama tiger. It's like, oh my God. Wait, so the, la again. the latest one. Have you guys seen the flying squirrel? 
that oh, yes. with the broomstick. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. That is the funniest. He's dead. Yes. yes. And he's like, well, and then he moves it around and he's like, ah, oh my God. Oh my God. Again, oh my God. It's, again, it's, yeah. it's, again, it's, we are connecting here and hopefully people connect, connect in those kinds of ways. Yes. And they're simple, simple, yes. uplifting, loving ways. Yes. Oh, okay. That's, that's, Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Okay. So for me, the, I just recently came back from vacation. I spent 10 days in Panama and it's not, it's not a country that I was thinking it was on my list of places to go, but it just so happened. I, I went there with a friend and my, um, I have some friends who live there in Panama city. So visited them and their brand new hotel, which is Freaking to die for. I mean, what's the is, name of the hotel? It's called Hotel La Campagna, and it is a historic masterpiece. It is. It oh, dates back to the 17th century. It was holy a Jesu- moly. part of it was a Jesuit mission, and it is a love letter to Panama. I mean, literally, they they did so much research and history in the history of this uh, property, but also Panama, and it's just a testament to this country and the people who made it. The the hotel is exquisite. I mean, um, it was exquisite. But the reason why I'm bringing all of this up is for me, sometimes I have to just physically get away, right? Uh, yeah. To just clear my mind and just Check get out. away from the distractions of everyday life. And vacation, you know, I don't go on vacation very often. And a lot of us don't. And that's the problem, right? We just work, 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 work. You just get caught up in life. And we mm. just don't take that break. So mm-hmm. for me, when I go on vacation, I really do turn off. I become a different person almost. It's like, I feel like the weight of everything off my shoulders. And I, I sometimes sit there on vacation going, why can't I just feel like this all the time at mm-hmm. home? But you can't because you have to get back to the real world. But vacation for me really resets me and refreshes me and makes me feel like I can get back and feel energized again. Um, mm, yeah. but I got to tell you, Panama, wow. What a surprise. It is a I've heard great things. stunningly beautiful country. Very diverse. I went from Panama city to the mountainous area that's called Boquete, where there's volcanoes and coffee farms and jungles, waterfalls. And then we went to an Island called Contadora Island, which is turquoise waters, beautiful beaches. Just it's, it was stunning. It was yeah, those pictures look like you were in Tahiti. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's what the water. Were you looking like. at the Atlantic or the Pacific? That's what I was confused about. It was, pa- I was going- Pacific. Okay. It was, it okay. Was the Gulf of Panama. Right. So a lot of it is um, sort of very Caribbean waters. I mean, so it's very clear, very turquoise waters, very warm, very mm-hmm. warm water. Um, so it really is a beautiful country, not really heard about much, right? It's Mm, sort of mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. the undiscovered part of Central America. Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. a lot of tourists don't go there. It's like a pit stop for cruise ships. Yeah. But now people are starting to discover. Yeah. 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 It's like Costa Rica, right? Nobody knew of Costa Rica. It's like, what? What's Costa Rica? But now it feels like Panama. And I just looked it up. Sorry for, it was like Hotel La Compañía. You guys, I'm telling you, my friend, Chris Lenz and his wife, Vicky, I've known them for 25 plus years because we met in Hong Kong. Chris is a mastermind and visionary when it comes to restaurants and hotels. And he did that in Hong Kong and Singapore. And, and you know, now he did that in Panama. Yeah. I, I, I've i never really quite seen the likes of a hotel like this. Um, wow. Where it's such a tribute to the history and the location um, and the beauty of, you know, what this country is about and its people. So I, mm. I highly recommend it. And d- don't worry, they didn't pay me to do this or like I paid for my <laughs> hotel, all that. It's just that I just was so blown away by this ma- yeah. masterpiece. So um, yeah, if you guys get a chance, anyone, you should go visit this okay. place and visit okay. Panama. Hotel La Campania. La, La Campania. Yes, it's La Campania. beautiful. It's Campania. beautiful. But, uh, okay. but Panama itself is beautiful. I brought home some really delicious coffee. Um, mm. So Yeah. So yeah, had a good time. So that's, that's my tip. Vacation. Vacation is important. So. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Even if it's just getting away an hour, an yeah. hour away, just the weekend environments. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So again, we want to thank our sponsor Lemieux, of course, and our new sponsor AARP. 
So yes. um, we got some good sponsors for this show, ladies. Right? Woo-hoo! Congratulations. Yeah. Thank, know, you. It's, it's Thank really, you. It's, it's Thank working you. out for us so far. But uh, anyway, always great to see you both. Um, but we'll see each other very soon again for the next episode. Thank you, I everyone. Can't wait till we're all together again. I know. I know. We'll be the same room. <laughs> no, no, we're not. We're not. We're not just saying this. We ha- we're going to be finally together physically and do the show. So we'll we'll make that happen as you know, once Kelly gets her ass back here. So, <laughs> um, anyway, and she's not traveling for pleasure. She's traveling for work. Yes. So again. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Safe travels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you guys. Thanks everyone for tuning in, listening or watching, watching or listening. Please sign up for our show. Subscribe on YouTube. Uh, Also give us a great rating and a review on any podcast platform that you uh, use. We would appreciate that. All right. Until next time, everyone. See ya. Thank you. Spreading aloha a la Kelly Who style. (laughs) 